Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the uh, Institute for Mathematical Sciences, or in short, IMS, uh, is a university level research institute at NUS. Its mission is to promote interest and in research in the mathematical sciences and their applications. It organizes thematic programs and brings together foreign and local mathematicians and scientists of diverse backgrounds for interaction, cross-fertilization of ideas, and collaboration in research. It also organizes public lectures to promote public awareness of the role of mathematics in other disciplines, and lectures to schools and math camps to stimulate students in their study of mathematics. This evening's public lecture is jointly organized by IMS and the IEEE Singapore Communications Chapter. We are pleased to have Professor Sergio Verdu of Princeton University as a speaker. We are also thankful to i r for kindly allowing us to use its auditorium for this occasion. Professor, Perdu, Professor Verdu is Professor of Electrical Engineering at Princeton University, where he is a member of the Information Sciences and Systems Group and the Program in Applied and Computational Mathematics. His research interests are in information theory, data compression and transmission, and signal processing. Professor Verdu received his telecommunications engineering degree from the Polytechnic University of Catalonia in Barcelona, Spain in 1980. He's very young compared to me. <laughs> and his PhD degree in electrical engineering from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 1984. His doctoral research pioneered the field of multi-user detection. He's a recipient of many awards and prizes. I don't want to go down the list, but I'd like to mention two. He received the 2000 Frederick E. Thurman Award from the American Society for Engineering Education and the IEEE Third Millennium Medal in 2000. In 2005, he received a doctorate honoris causa from the Polytechnic University of Catalonia. Catalonia. His papers, of course, he, but his papers also received many awards he received for his papers, <laughs> which include the D. Fink Paper Award from the IEEE, the 1998 Information Theory Outstanding Paper Award, a Golden Jubilee Paper Award from the IEEE Information Theory Society, the 2000 Paper Award from the Japan Telecommunications Advancement Foundation, and the 2002 Leonard G. Abraham Prize Award from the IEEE Communication Society. Professor Verdu has served as Associate Editor of the IEEE Transactions on Automatic Control and as Associate Editor of Shannon Theory of the IEEE Transactions on Information Theory. He was elected Fellow of the IEEE in 1993 for contributions to multi-user communications and to information theory. He served as an elected member of the IEEE Information Theory Society Board of Governors in 1989 to 1999 and was president of the IEEE Information Theory Society in 1997. He's currently editor-in-chief of Foundations and Trends in Communications and Information Theory. He has held visiting appointments at the National at the Australian National University, the Technion Israel Institute of Technology, the University of Tokyo, and the University of California at Berkeley. In 2002, he was a Hewitt Packard Visiting Research Professor at the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute at Berkeley. He's a member of the Technion Center for Communication and Information Technology, the Technical Advisory Board of Flarion Technologies, and the Scientific Advisory Board of Telefonia I plus D. Am I right? Well, he has a lot of accolades, so uh, I have to stop here. Otherwise, he has no time to give his public lecture. <laughs> so it is now my great pleasure to invite Professor Verdu to deliver his lecture on trends in wireless communication. Sergio. Thank you, uh, Professor Chen, for the uh, uh, very kind introduction, and thank you all for coming. Um, so today, um, as you can see here, I have added a subtitle to the lecture, and the subtitle has the word fury in it, but uh, the good news is that uh, I only have uh, 
two slides with equations, okay? So most of it won't have equations, but don't expect that I will be talking about the latest CDMA or TDMA or uh, OFDMA or, or things like that. It's really gonna be a talk about what is uh, in the mind of information theorists who work on um, topics related to wireless, uh, what is in, in our mind these days and what are the main challenges and what we think is going to be the road ahead in, um, in the next few years. Okay, so um, the, uh, the birth of information theory happened in 1948 with um, Claude Shannon's uh, uh, paper on a mathematical theory of communication. And uh, this, uh, this paper, of course, was an immediate sensation. Uh, and uh, people thought that this was going to be the, the theory of everything. And um, after a while, it became clear that information theory was going to be a success in the sphere of communications, perhaps not as much a success in other spheres as people may have expected at the beginning. But even in communications, uh, it took a while and until uh, the theory that Shannon had invented uh, became uh, practical or became uh, of relevance to uh, what engineers were doing um, in, the, in the practical field. Now, my computer is doing, I don't know, the hard disk is going crazy, so let's hope that Nothing bad is going to happen during the talk. Okay, so information theory uh, has been a success story. And um, the reason why it has uh, been a success story has to do with mainly these three bullets I have here. First of all, because it developed the right model for point-to-point -point communication. It formulated the right questions about performance, the right questions that engineers care about, but also that we can solve mathematically. And we use the right tools to answer these questions, okay? Pri primarily tools from uh, probability theory, tools like the law of large numbers, for example, okay? so. Uh, the success story has been quite revolutionary, both from the viewpoint of uh, compression of uh, information sources and from the viewpoint of transmission. Right? So we cannot understand the information revolution without actually understanding what is the, the key contribution of information theory to it. Okay, so it gives, it gives, it's a theory of what is possible. It's a theory of fundamental limits tells us how much information we can extract or we can eliminate, how much redundancy we can eliminate from a source, how much information we can transmit uh, through a channel reliably. Okay, so these are the, uh, these are kind of like the success stories and the reasons why information theory has been successful. Now, it has also acted not only it has um, served as a theory of fundamental limits that tells us what we can do and we cannot do, but also it acts like a driver of technology in the sense that it gives us an idea of how to build systems that will come close to these fundamental limits. So here I have two examples, and those of you who uh, um, are familiar with communications will be familiar with. Uh, the first comes from the time of Shannon, the band-limited additive, additive Gaussian channel, which is really a very good model for the copper wire telephone channel. Um, Shannon came up with a very elegant and intuitive solution, water filling. And nowadays, uh, orthogonal frequency division uh, systems, for example, the ones that are implemented in, um, in uh, digital subscriber loops that enable you to uh, browse the web at megabits per second, these systems follow the principles that uh, 
uh, information theory gives you. Okay? Not only we give formulas for what is the capacity, but also these formulas actually uh, uh, suggest algorithms to uh, come close to those limits. Another example is the single user multi-antenna channel. There we have an elegant and intuitive solution, um, the log debt formula, which is just a formula that shows that what matters from this channel are the singular values of a certain channel matrix. So this uh, solution has directly influenced the receiver architecture, the BLAST architecture, and has led to uh, uh, standards that are already, um, that are already uh, implemented that deliver 4 bits per second per hertz. So these are examples where information theory has acted as a direct uh, driver of technology. Okay, so here are some other examples that uh, have been driven by information theory uh, uh, thinking. Now CDMA, uh, code division multiple access, is the basis for second and third generation uh, wireless uh, cellular systems. And of course the second generation uh, dates back to the uh, 1990s, but actually the origins of CDMA uh, go back to Second World War. And Claude Shannon was actually one of the proponents of CDMA. Space-time codes, codes that take advantage of not only degrees of freedom in the time domain, but also in the space domain, multiple antennas. Uh, Multi-user detection, um, also that's a discipline that actually started with information theory, because in uh, achieving the capacity of multi-access channels, you really need to exploit the structure of the multi-access interference. Uh, this uh, BLAST um, architecture for multi-antenna systems or multi-antenna receivers also was, as I mentioned in the previous slide, directly driven by capacity results. Superposition coding, um, this is uh, also something that comes from the study of broadcast channels in information theory where um, you actually send the sum of signals intended for uh, several receivers, maybe some receivers are close to the transmitter, enjoy very high signal to noise ratio and therefore they can decode uh, signals with higher reliability or higher precision than other receivers with lower signal to noise ratio. And other technologies, uh, very important, the technologies of sparse graph codes, turbo codes and low density parity check codes. Uh, these technologies are actually a departure from a classical coding theory, which itself was a departure from Shannon's thinking in 1948. And here these codes have gone back to the origins, to what Shannon uh, told us in 1948, which at that time only looked like a, proof, uh, a way of proving theorems because Shannon said, well, I don't know how to construct codes. I don't even know how to construct a single code, let alone a very good one or an optimum one. So what I'll do is I'll just analyze a code chosen at random, show that the average performance is good, and therefore there must exist a, a good code. The problem is that um, that is not a constructive procedure because the codes that we uh, select at random do not have a structure and therefore uh, are not implementable with reasonable complexity, either at encoder or decoder. So these codes have enough structure so that you can uh, implement them um, in linear time and they have enough random structure that uh, they approach close to the channel limit. Okay, here is, uh, is a sample of other technologies that have been driven by information theory and that have, uh, uh, there are actually, some of them are, are very much uh, at the forefront of uh, the state of the art in technology. Okay, so uh, what I will be focusing on in, uh, in the rest of the talk is going to be on network information theory. 
So as, as I said at the beginning, the, the biggest success story of, the, of information theory, of, of Shannon's theory, has been point-to-point -point communication. We are now interested in uh, uh, not only point-to-point -point channels, but in channels where there are several transmitters, several receivers. So uh, here are the main building blocks of um, networks. First of all, the multi-axis channel. This is a channel where we have several transmitters and one receiver. So think, for example, of the channel that goes from your cellular phones to uh, the nearest base station. Okay, that's a multiple axis channel. And actually that channel was formulated by Shannon in 1961. He said, I have found a solution to this channel. I will publish it in a future paper. Actually, he never published any other paper by himself. Uh, and it was only 10 years later that uh, the solution was found. Okay, so that's, that's a very important channel. And uh, it's an exception rather than the rule, because that's really the only building block for which we have a complete solution. Now you may think, well, what about the reverse case, where you have one transmitter and several receivers? Okay, I may be transmitting information. For example, in a lecture, you may be uh, transmitting to uh, receivers that have different goals. For example, I may want to transmit very detailed information to some students, to some of the more advanced students, and some more elementary information to some of the others. Everybody hears the same thing, but what you intend to transmit to each receiver may be different. Okay, or a base station transmitting to different cellular phones. Well, that channel, formulated in 1972, has defied many efforts. So we know how to find the capacity of that channel only in relatively simple special cases. Okay, we are still far away from full solution for that channel. Now Shannon also in, in that paper where he formulated the multiple access channel, he also formulated the interference channel. And this is uh, very simple to, uh, to explain. Just think of uh, to uh, telephone users that are connected to, uh, um, to, two other telephone, uh, to two other telephones. But of course, there is some crosstalk because there is some coupling uh, of the telephone wires. And uh, you want to find out how does that crosstalk affect the maximum rates of information that you can transmit. Now, notice that now it's no longer a multi axis channel because each of the receivers is only interested in one of the transmissions, not in receiving both of the transmissions. Well, that turns out that even in the simplest case, where you just have a two by two matrix embedded in Gaussian noise, even that case, we don't know how to find the capacity of that channel. Okay, so it's really humbling that for something so simple, we still don't know what the capacity is 58 years after Shannon. Okay. Relay channels. So one transmitter, one receiver, but I can reach the receiver through, say, a direct line of sight component. But also there is a relay that can hear my uh, information to something, some sophisticated processing, and then transmitter to the, transmit to the receiver. Okay. Even in that case, that is, sounds like a very simple case, just one sender and one receiver, again, we don't have a full characterization of capacity. We only know how to solve this problem in certain special cases. Okay, so now think of a network where we may have several senders, several receivers, several relays, several sources of information, you know, if we cannot solve the building blocks, can we expect to have a solution for the whole network? Okay, so this is the unfulfilled uh, promise of network information theory, the fact that the capacity of the building uh, blocks is still open. 
So now the questions are important questions to address. And by and large, these uh, questions, the, the answer to these questions are going to drive the uh, research agenda for the next few years uh, in theory, and therefore it's going to drive what, what practice will be, achieve, will be achieving uh, in a decade from now. Can we find right models that are simple? The success story of information theory is that you deconstruct the problem into simple building blocks. So can we find right models that are simple but capture the, the essential ingredients of a mobile wireless network? Can we define suitable metrics? The obsession in network information theory has been the set of all achievable rates that I can have for all this collection of users. Perhaps that's too much to ask, and perhaps there is something else that, that we can use. Can we develop new tools, new approaches? Can we find other mathematical theories that are going to be the key to solving some of these challenges. Can we incorporate protocols? Protocols are, of course, algorithms that happen um, at higher levels. And it has been a perennial challenge in information theory to actually take into account some of these uh, issues, like the bursty nature of information sources and so on. Okay, so networks uh, in, within engineering and computer science are, are broached by a tremendous, uh, tremendous uh, uh, broad swath of, of researchers, ranging from computer scientists that really are not grounded in, uh, in probability to people like in information theory that are working at the very, very uh, physical, just the physical layer. So can we come up with a theory that spans uh, more than just one of these uh, levels. Okay, so what are the challenges? Well, we've seen already uh, some of the challenges in the sense that the building blocks are hard to tackle. Well, here are some of them that I'm going to elaborate uh, in the next few slides. The fact that um, Unlike something like the telephone channel, where basically there are only a few parameters that define the channel, like for example, the transfer function of the channel, and then the noise level or the noise power spectral density. Here we're gonna have many other things to worry about. Then there is a technical issue that I will illustrate, and that's the only place where you're gonna see equations, single letter versus multi-letter. The distributed nature of uh, the problem is also a big headache. And then there is this issue of cross-layer optimization, as I pointed out in the, in, the other, uh, in the other slide. Can we incorporate protocols? Can we have a much, uh, much longer term view of the problem, not just trying to, uh, uh, to optimize at one level, but perhaps doing an optimization that takes into account other issues in the problem. Okay, so let's get on with this, the description of these challenges. And uh, let's start with the multiplicity of models. So here you'll see that we have a lot of things to worry about in, uh, in wireless, in the network wireless uh, environment. First of all, we have to worry about topology. We have to worry about traffic patterns. We have to worry about the fact that we have a number of terminals that may be very large. Okay, so we may have to worry about scalability issues, about algorithms that are, uh, that are not, say, exponential in the number of terminals, for example. We have to worry about the fact that terminals uh, may be very heterogeneous. Some terminals may have just one antenna. Some uh, terminals may have multiple antennas. Some receivers may be dumb. You want to incorporate in your model the fact that the receiver does not have a lot of processing power. For example, people now are talking about sensor networks where you may have um, 
a lot of nodes in a network and each of these nodes may be something that is extremely cheap and does not have a lot of power. Maybe it's, it's, it's uh, operated by a battery or is solar uh, by a solar cell and cannot spend a lot of power doing processing. Okay, so of course, getting to the fundamental limits of any theory is going to, to require a lot of processing power. Okay, so it may be a receiver that is not able to exploit the structure of interference, or it may be a receiver that is indeed able to do that. The signal-to-noise ratio conditions may be quite different. So when I design a, a DSL system, digital subscriber loop, I have some range of signal-to-noise ratios depending on how far the customer premises are from the central office of the telephone company, but it's not a huge range. Whereas in a, in a wireless network, these uh, signal-to-noise ratio conditions may be extremely different from one place to another. You may be operating in a, in a wideband, low SNR regime, or you may be operating in a high spectral efficiency regime. Maybe within the same system or maybe within different systems. Okay, this is going to have a, a tremendous, tremendous <coughs> impact on how you will design the system. And also on what kind of tools, what kind of mathematical tools you're going to use in order to analyze the, the, the system. So nowadays with fading communications, what people like to do is instead of uh, trying to come up with analyses that are too ambitious in the sense that they work for all, uh, all signal-to-noise ratios, concentrate on both, on both ends. And then when you concentrate on both ends, and then you get, uh, you get insight in what happens at low SNR, what happens at high SNR, then you pretty much have covered all bases. Other things that we have to worry about, propagation conditions, path loss exponents, fading statistics. How fast is the fading? Of course, uh, now we have a mobile network, so the fading uh, dynamics uh, are important. In information theory, classically, we rely on, <coughs> on law of large numbers, on ergodic results. Uh, well, maybe the fading dynamics are slow enough that you cannot rely on, uh, on ergodic results. Maybe the, the code words that you send are not going to see all possible realizations of these fading statistics. Problem is maybe decentralized, maybe centralized, maybe something in between. There, is, there may be some partial coordination between users. The users may be synchronized or not. We may have random access. We may have coordinated access. We have to worry about the processing power at the terminals because except for maybe uh, some of the terminals in this network the others are not going to be plugged to the uh, to the power supply they will have to be autonomous and therefore power is a very important consideration limited memory and also the fact that we may not be able to uh, uh, to have unlimited delay for these kind of systems latency is an issue Okay, so this brings this, this problem of multiplicity of models. The fact that the problem is very rich. We have this bar burden of modeling. Something that you have to be very careful. Because if you say, okay, so let me put all these ingredients, because if I wanna be, if I wanna be relevant to the practical world, I have to take care of all those things. Well, you have to be careful because if you are too ambitious and you try to uh, get very precise models, first of all, you're going to have hard, a hard time solving the problem. <coughs> Second, even if you solve it, the solutions are going to be hard to interpret. Right? So you may be able to get a number. You, know, you may be able to have a number that says, OK, so under uh, all these vector of conditions, you can transmit that. 1.75 megabits per second, but how you achieve that number may be very hard to tell from the solutions because they are not going to give you so much insight. All right, so there is something to be said by what I said before, deconstructing, okay? Trying to attack only one aspect at a time, one or two aspects at a time. 
okay, just like Shannon did in 1948. Okay, so in that way, you, you, uh, um, you make your, your life easier in the sense that you have a, a, a better chance of solving the problem. You'll have a better understanding of capacity. You'll get formulas that are prettier, that are more elegant. And you'll be able to drive design. You'll be able to give lessons that are of interest to engineers. Not just numbers, but design lessons. OK, so uh, I mentioned um, among, the, um, among the challenges in network information theory is this issue of single letter versus multi-letter. So I know there are a few uh, experts in the audience uh, in, in information theory. So this is more uh, geared towards those people who already have some uh, knowledge of information theory, but I promise you that it's going to be a short parenthesis if this doesn't mean much to you. So the famous Shannon formula for the capacity of a channel looks like this. You have a measure of the dependence between the input and the output of the channel. This is called mutual information. And the channel capacity is this very nice formula, which tells, tells you that the capacity is going to be the maximal of these mutual informations maximized over the input distributions, which we denote by x. OK, that's in the case of a memoryless channel. This is what is called a single letter uh, solution. In the case of a channel with memory, then you lose this luxury of having a single letter solution and then you have this uh, maximization over distributions that happen on vectors of n components and then the solution is just a limit of a vector of n components where the dimensionality is going to infinity okay, so it still is an optimization problem we have two optimization problems this is going to be harder but it's a lot easier than just the original optimization problem which is just find the best possible code. Okay. So sometimes you can solve this optimization problem. Sometimes you can solve also this limit. So for example, this water filling solution that I alluded to before, that is the basis for DSL technology, that comes from solving this limit and this maximization. OK, now if you go to these multi-axis channels, Remember that that's the channel that was um, that was proposed by Shannon, but only solved ten years later. Then uh, you have both uh, for memoryless channels. Uh, you have both a single letter characterization and a multi-letter characterization of capacity, and these two are the same. Okay, we know we know how to uh, solve this single letter characterization in the sense that we know. Uh, for channels of interest, like for example Gaussian channels, we know how to get to the boundary of this region of rates. So this, uh, this is just for two transmitters, what is going to be the trade-off in rates that they can achieve. However, here we still don't know how to solve this problem. We still don't know what are the, opti what are the inputs that achieve the boundary of this region. So that's for the multi-axis channel, where the problem has already been solved in a single letter way. But if you go now to the interference channel, which is very similar to the other one, except that now we have two receivers, and each of them is interested only in, the, in its corresponding user, then we only have a multi-letter expression. We, only, we don't have a single letter expression. And, and right now, we don't know how to uh, do this union. We don't know how to optimize and get the boundary of that region. Okay. You have a question? No. Hmm? It, it may be, it may be, but it may be that we require other, uh, other information measures. Maybe mutual information is not the right thing. Or it may be that even for memoryless systems, this is the best we can do. In which case, we have to find good computational uh, approaches, good ways of computing at least approximations to this boundary. 
Okay? It, maybe what happens is that someone is going to come up with a good idea of narrowing the search of these random processes to the right random process. Once we narrow the, the search to the right random process, then we will be done. Of course, the first thing that you can think of if the interference channel is a Gaussian channel is that these inputs are going to be Gaussian and therefore that you can just limit yourself to the choice of power speckle densities. Okay, we actually showed that that's no good, that you don't want to restrict yourself to Gaussian inputs. Okay, so the, the, problem is, the problem is far from easy. Okay, so that's it for formulas. The distributed nature of network information theory is another source of headaches. You have uh, the issue of distributed computation. You have the issue of communication complexity. You may have protocols where you exchange information. Then you have the whole issue that um, you, know, you, you may have uh, a game here between players that are not cooperative. So, uh, so the objectives of different users may not be aligned in the same direction. Maybe people want to just be selfish rather than contribute to the common good. So there's a whole slew of problems that come out of this. Utility is another, uh, it's another issue that usually we don't think of in the context of point-to-point -point channels. But in the context of, um, of networks, now it's becoming uh, an interesting research field. OK, so the idea now is we're going to have some notion of global utility. And then we want to uh, allocate resources or design degrees of freedom so that we can maximize that utility even if we are pursuing just selfish interests. OK, so in, uh, in wired networks, this uh, idea of pricing has uh, gotten a lot of traction and has uh, become um, quite useful, for example, in uh, paradigms like the internet. So can we come up with similar uh, paradigms in wireless networks? How, do you wanna, how do you, can you make the jump from maximizing over utility over rates to maximizing utility over a combination of user rates and user powers? Okay, because now we can not only uh, play with the rate at which you, we transmit, but in a wireless network we can also play with the power at which we transmit. The higher the power, the, the uh, more neighbors I'm going to be affecting. Okay? So the higher the rate I'll be able to sustain, but of course the lower the rate that other people may be sustaining. So the problem of maximizing utility in the wireless world is much more complicated than in the internet-like -like wor world because of the interaction of all these layers of congestion control and medium access control and the physical layer. Now, fortunately, uh, optimization theory uh, has made quite a few uh, advances in, uh, in the last few years. And uh, we, uh, we now have some tools, some optimization tools that we didn't have just uh, 10 years ago. So a lot of people who work on optimization, uh, who are gurus of optimization, actually are uh, applying their, um, their skills to networks. So people like Steve Lowe, people like Mung Chiang, and so on, they, um, they are very good at applying these things to wired networks. It remains to be seen whether we can have similar applications to wireless networks. Now, there is this idea of layering as optimization uh, decomposition. And the problem here is that we want to, as I, as I said before, we want to um, take a broader view of the problem and not just uh, solve the pure physical layer problem, but perhaps solve the whole stack of layer problems from an optimization viewpoint. So 
there are different ways in which you can decompose a given problem. And each of these ways of decomposing the problem is going to correspond to a different layering architecture. Okay, perhaps at some level you take care of the error control coding, at some other level you take care of removing redundancy from the data so that um, you compress as much as you can. At some other level you are you may be doing routing, you may be doing flow control, and so on and so forth. So these layering schemes have different trade-offs in terms of efficiency, robustness, asymmetry of information and control, as well as computation and communication. Now, each sub-problem that corresponds to a layer in the language of optimization is going to have these primal or dual variables that are, be, uh, are going to be coordinating these sub-problems and these, these variables are the ones that control the interfaces between the layers. So the idea is that by setting the problem in that way, it's going to do the layering for you. If you are actually able to find the solution to the optimization problem itself, it's going to be able to do the layering for you, rather than us coming up from the beginning and do something arbitrary. Okay, so this is a way to answer the question how to and how not to layer. Okay. okay, so now let me talk a little bit about emerging tools. Um, as if we expect to solve problems that have been around for uh, decades, we have to come up with some new approaches. We have to have a bigger toolbox that uh, people had just uh, 10 years ago. And indeed, there are many exciting tools that now we have at our disposal that we didn't have only a few years ago. Uh, a few years ago. So I'm going to tell you about, um, about a few of these tools. And let me start by one that is very dear to my heart and that um, came out of Dong Ning Guo, who is sitting right here in the audience. Um, out of his PhD thesis. Dong Ning actually was a master's student here at the National University of Singapore. And then in Princeton, he came up with a very important result in information theory, which is a, it's a bridge between uh, the uh, estimation world and the information theory world. All right, so uh, through that bridge, um, we have been able to solve several problems that in principle do not seem to be um, at, at all related to estimation theory. We have been able to come up with new representation of information measures. Some very simple proofs of classical results in Shannon theory that go back to Shannon's paper in 1948. Uh, some results in nonlinear continuous time filtering, even problems that have nothing to do with communications. Okay, and uh, we can find, uh, find new results and, and uh, of course, new proofs for uh, results that uh, have to do with filtering and smoothing of continuous time random processes. And also, intriguing is the fact that in many of the capacity achieving structures in multi-user information theory, and even in single-user information theory, these MMSC estimators are basic building blocks. Okay, so perhaps um, this tool, this estimation theoretic tool, also has something to do with network information theory. And perhaps um, we can find either explicit results or maybe this, we can use it as a bounding technique. Now, control theory um, has uh, had a a very limited impact in communications, actually, much more limited than one would have expected. But here we are dealing with problems where latency is an issue, where dynamics are uh, an issue because of mobility of uh, users and so on. And we have systems that are far from equilibrium. So perhaps control theory is going to have something to do with network information theory. Who knows? Optimization and game theory, I've already shown you uh, a sample of uh, problems where optimization is going to, uh, to be useful. 
this uh, issue of Lagrange duality has already provided some of the sharp characterizations of the duality between transmission and compression. So actually, if you go back to the original Shannon formula that I showed you, where you have this mutual information and you maximize over the input distribution, that gives you the capacity of the channel. But a kind of dual formula where you minimize that mutual information over not the input, but over the system that connects output with input, that's going to give you the fundamental limit of data compression with distortion. Completely different problem, but it has a dual solution. Perhaps optimization is going to be the key to, if we cannot find single letter characterizations, being able to solve those, op those uh, optimization problems that we don't know how to solve right now, having to do with how, how do we uh, find optimal inputs and how do we compute the limits as dimensions go to infinity. These cuts and bounds are really the only approach we know in information theory to get, uh, to get outer bounds or, or uh, upper bounds to rates. And they are really inspired by flow, type of flow, uh, information flow type of thinking. So perhaps we can obtain those bounds by appealing to some form of duality. Okay, so these problems of network information theory are essentially non-convex optimization problems as opposed to the single user problems that are nicely convex and for which we can find out very efficient algorithms. Here we have to work a lot harder and fortunately these are exciting times in optimization and then we can capitalize hopefully on what the latest advances are. Statistical physics. Uh, of course, the statistical physics and information theory go way back because, uh, you know, Boltzmann was really the first one to come up with the entropy uh, concept. But um, by and large, the problems uh, they are interested in are completely different. There is some commonality in some of the questions, but uh, by and large, they have remained quite separate until very recently. And it turns out that some of the ideas of, from a statistical physics have been instrumental in, uh, in getting insight into communications problems. The first one here is a problem that I was interested in for a long, long time. And I never made any headway until... Uh, the solution came up in 2002. A Japanese researcher, Tanaka, showed that statistical physics was the right approach to this problem. Okay? To the problem of multi-user finding the minimum bit error rate in uncoded multi-user detection in the many user limit. And then Dong Ning Guo also, uh, in his PhD thesis, uh, extended uh, Tanaka's, um, Tanaka's setting um, uh, and actually, you'll see uh, Ralph uh, Mueller, Professor Mueller, is going to give a talk uh, tomorrow or Thursday. Thursday on uh, on this whole topic of uh, using a statistical physics as a tool in uh, communications. Okay, so this is a very exciting discipline. Capacity analysis of CDMA and multi antenna communications. That has also been done with the statistical physics. Some of these problems, by the way, there are several ways to, uh, to solve them, not only with the statistical physics, but with other tools. The advantage of using some of the other tools, like random matrices, is that you don't have to rely on things like the replica uh, method from a statistical physics, which still don't have a rigorous justification. But there are problems uh, where you know, statistical physics so far is the only answer. Another very important uh, domain of application of statistical physics has been the analysis of these sparse graph codes that I told you before. They have been able to come up with almost 95%, 98% of Shannon capacity. Uh, well, those codes are actually hard to analyze because we don't use 
optimum, uh, optimum decoders. We have to use suboptimum decoders so that they can be decoded with reasonable complexity. And then the analysis of those suboptimal decoders is quite challenging. Well, statistical physics has, has given some quite important insights. Hey, random matrix theory. That's why many of us are here uh, in Singapore this week. So uh, this is another uh, very nice emerging tool that we have been applying to communications for the last uh, eight or nine years. And this is important both in the non-asymptotic and the asymptotic regime, both for fixed number of users, fixed number of antennas, and in the large uh, system uh, limit. By and large, this is much more important because these large system results, the results, for example, that derive from the application of the Marchenko and Pasteur, Silverstein and Bay uh, type of, uh, of setting, those results are design drivers. We can get design ideas from those results. From non-asymptotic results, they are just too messy and complicated, okay? So we may be able to get a number that is much more accurate if I'm interested in analyzing a system with five antennas. It's more accurate than the one for infinity. But the formula for infinity is going to give the, uh, the engineer insight, whereas the formula for five is just going to be a mess, an impenetrable mess. Okay. Capacity of CDMA. Uh, fundamental limits of linear multi-user detection. Actually, this is how we started. Before we started uh, looking at random matrix theory for capacity, uh, we started looking at what would be the, um, the, um, the limits of uh, minimum mean square error uh, multi-user detection. As the number of users goes to infinity, when we have a random sequence model. Okay, those were the first results, which uh, were obtained. Uh, we obtained some of those, and then Sen, Hanley, in Berkeley also obtained some of those. And it, it turns out that the Stilges transform, which is very important for uh, people like Charles, Jack Silverstein, uh, Professor Bai, that Stilges transform is very related to things that the engineers are interested in. Okay, we actually call it uh, by a different way, the eta transform, but is a uh, is very related con uh, concept. So after that, uh, we've been able to apply random matrix theory uh, in, uh, in many problems in, uh, in channel theory, finding the capacity of various um, wireless systems. There is also work on capacity of ad hoc networks with random uh, topologies, which also uses uh, random matrices. So we have been not only consumers of results, but I would like to think that we have also contributed to uh, random matrix theory in the sense that we have also introduced some, uh, some new tools, uh, new transforms. We have proven uh, theorems that were not there, theorems on random matrix theory that were not there before. And we have asked questions that are of interest to us and uh, that are relevant. They may be very interesting questions from the viewpoint of random matrix theory. So that's a, a nice intercourse between information theory and other fields in mathematics. It's not the first time that that happens, but it's really another beautiful example of that, uh, that kind of pendulum going back and forth. There is also fundamental limits in networks that are not of the Shannon type. And a very important one is the max flow mean cut theorem. Okay, also known as the Ford Fulkerson theorem. Okay, some of you who have taken a course on optimization may have seen this. Well, it's funny that I say that this is a non Shannon fundamental limit because at the same time that Ford and, and Fulkerson proved it, Shannon proved the same, the same result famous Ford Fulkerson uh, theorem was also proven by Shannon and uh, Elias and Feinstein at MIT in 1956 using a different proof. Right, so the idea there is that you have, you have links in a network, say in a, in a wired network, 
think of these links as having some finite capacity, capacity not meant in the Shannon sense, but capacity just meant in the how, how, much, uh, how many liters of water can you pump through a pipe, OK? So you want to know how much flow you can, you can send from the source to the destination. So the solution is going to be given by the, uh, the worst bottleneck, the mean cut. Okay. So it turns out that now there is a very uh, vibrant field um, that a lot of people who have been working on error correcting codes now are working on. Uh, this came up came out of a researcher in Hong Kong, Raymond Jung. He came up with this network uh, coding. And this is a way to achieve this maximum flow. It really has nothing to do with information theory. But it uses error correcting codes. Many of them, the thinking really comes from information theory, to achieve those limits. So it turns out that if you are in a model uh, like the internet, where all you can do is you have a packet, and all you can do is, at each node, you can decide where to send it, which route to send it. If you could do something uh, more uh, sophisticated than that, for example, you could sum. You could do a binary sum between packets at nodes and send not the packets, not the original packets you receive, but send some, uh, some operations on those packets then you could increase the flow in the network. Okay? And the way you do that is very much along the ways of linear uh, error correcting codes. And then there is this issue of transport capacity uh, that has also gotten quite a bit of following. And just to give you an idea of what this is, just a very high level idea, this is not, not information theoretic. But the idea here is that you have a bunch of nodes in an area. They can be sources of information, but they can also be relays of information. So uh, think, think, for example, of, uh, of uh, your Wi-Fi at home, uh, being able to communicate with the Wi-Fi of your neighbor, and uh, the neighbor with his neighbor, and so on and so forth, in which case you could have a path from your origin to some destination far away. Okay, so if you were to allow that, each node not only to be a source in a sink of information, but a relay, um, you could ask several interesting questions. You could, for example, maximize the bits per, mi per meter per bits per meter per second that your uh, network would be able to transmit. So, in this work by uh, Gupta and Kumar which is the work that uh, came up, uh, that originated all this area, they use very simple receivers. They use temporal scheduling so that uh, when two uh, nodes that are within earshot of each other are transmitting, you avoid collisions on purpose because you have very unsophisticated receivers. So very simple interference model. And then the idea is how to arrange these origin and destination sensors and the scheduling to minimize the interference. And then they prove that the total transmit, transport capacity grows with the size of the network as the square root of the number of nodes. This is the total capacity. So that means that per node, the amount of information that you can transmit is actually going down with the size of the network. So you have more people to rely on in order to transmit your information, but at the same time, you have also more chances for interference. And then the evil forces actually are more uh, important than the good forces. So the network becomes clogged. As there are more and more sensors, the network become clogged, becomes clogged. And everyone is only able to send information as 1 over the square root of n. OK, so that's kind of a, a pessimistic bad news type of result. So uh, we're running out of time, but I just wanted to mention the fact that network information theory is not the only thing that it's open uh, in information theory. Don't get the wrong impression. There are also some problems that are, are very important and that they have 
they're still open after uh, a lot of um, uh, attacks on, on these on these problems. The problem of what happens in the finite block length regime, what happens when we incorporate delay into uh, the picture, what happens with feedback. A lot of the channels that we encounter in the real world are two-way channels. So the receiver can help the transmitter. But how do we take advantage of that feedback? Well, one of the very surprising results in information theory is that if the channel does not have memory, then even the best feedback that you can think of, instantaneous, full bandwidth, exact copy, the transmitter knows everything that the receiver has, that doesn't help. The channel capacity is the same. Well, it doesn't help in, in uh, getting higher capacity, but it helps enormously in uh, lowering the complexity of the transmission and receiver algorithms. It also helps very much in lowering the delay that you need in order to achieve uh, a given performance level. Okay, but still, uh, there is still a lot of work to be done in uh, harnessing the power of feedback. Rate distortion theory and lossy data compression, there there is a huge uh, gap between theory and practice. Whereas in lossless data compression and in data transmission, so Shannon came up with three problems, lossless data compression, lossy data compression, and data transmission. So the one that has been the less of a success story is the one of lossy data compression. Okay, the kind of theory you need in order to, like say for example, build MP3 systems, like the iPod. Okay, how much information do you decide to discard so that the human ear still hears a pretty good uh, rendition of what you uh, encode. Okay, those, uh, those algorithms are influenced by information theory, but not, not nearly as much as the uh, lossless data compression and data transmission systems. Okay, so perhaps one day we will understand the human ear and the human eye better so that we can harness the power of information theory and the power of Shannon's principles. So, the message I want to convey, just to close the lecture, is that information theory is increasingly relevant to the practical world. It has taken a long time uh, for us to achieve Shannon limits of the simplest channels, but still we have a long way to go, because every time technology enables us to do things that we, can only, we could only dream of uh, years before, and uh, we have more and more uh, channels and challenges in general to meet. But the nice thing is that this, uh, these nice formulas we can get from information theory drive the system design. It's a beautiful uh, fertile ground to import tools from, uh, from mathematics and even from <laughs> physics as we've, we've seen. And it's an inexhaustible source of open problems. So uh, it's, uh, it's a really good time for uh, people to get into information theory because it's, uh, it's really a vibrant discipline. Thank you very much. Sure, sure. Yes. Uh, so imagine it's 2046. How do you imagine uh, wireless networks uh, are used and um, I mean, what's the impact for human life and so on? I, I guess everybody heard me, great. Okay. Maybe you need to switch it on.
It's on. So, so. Do you need me to repeat my question? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. So let's say it's 2046 and the year 2046. How do we imagine wireless networks uh, are used and, and what's the impact on human life and, and what are going to be the technologies that uh, I, every one of us enjoy? Yeah, thanks. Uh, do you mind if we change it to 2048? <laughs> <laughs> That's the. That's the 100th anniversary of uh, Claude Shannon's uh, paper. Uh, well, it's hard to predict, especially the future. Um, but um, uh, what is for sure is that, uh, especially in the wireless field, uh, the spectrum is a fixed resource. It's a natural resource that we cannot fabricate, we cannot make. So we'll always have a fixed amount of spectrum that we have to use, that we have to share among a population, will always be concerned about not spending more energy than the necessary. So what is for sure is that Shannon theory will always be relevant to the design of those systems. Okay. So perhaps Shannon theory, now I can tell you of communication systems where Shannon theory is not relevant. For example, optical fiber systems the ones that are implemented today. But now, people who are looking ahead uh, of those systems see that information theory may be relevant because information theory may have uh, some answers to problems of interference between uh, different optical frequencies. Even though the bandwidth there is, uh, is really huge, and even though the processing speeds, speeds do not enable you to do a lot of very fancy signal processing at those speeds, now, they see that within some years in the future, also information theory is going to be relevant there. So, uh, so that would be, other than trying to, uh, to predict what, what uh, these things will look like or what will be the sociological impact of them, uh, that's my prediction. And of course, my basic prediction is that like the turbo codes, like these sparse craft codes and other technologies that always spring is that always the unexpected is the unexpected is going to happen okay and we're, we're going to have a technology that we didn't even dream of uh, just a few years before that is going to be completely disruptive and it's going to be a sea change in how we approach the problem See if this works, okay? Yeah, I was just wondering, um, does, do you think uh, inf information theory will help uh, in to, you know, analyzing the problem of the dynamic spectrum access? Because this is something that's coming up, you know, dynamic spectrum access that's been advocated, uh, I think, by some people uh, who is basically into the world of uh, smart radios or cognitive radios and adaptive radios. Yeah, so the idea is that, um, uh, that uh, if you, if you uh, turn on a spectrum analyzer uh, and you, you look at, at the frequency band in, in a fairly high band, you see that in, uh, in, many, uh, there, in many cases there are, there are holes in the spectrum that are not used at any particular time. So this, for example, is capitalized on by ultra-wideband. Because in ultra-wideband, yes, you, you interfere a little bit with some bands, but you take in, in advantage of the fact that a lot of the spectrum, even though it has been committed to some uses, is not used at, at some particular point. Okay, so you may want to go one step further, and instead of having something that has uh, ultra-wideband, it has a smaller band, but you're using a part of the spectrum that is unoccupied. Okay, so information theory, of course, is uh, completely uh, connected to this because it's going to tell you, okay, well, if you have this uh, piece of a spectrum, this is how much you can get out of it. Okay, how you will actually do the algorithmic uh, way of assignment of rates and so on is something that you are going to build upon information theoretic formulas. But perhaps the algorithmic aspect of how you do it it's not going to be information theoretic. But at the end, you will probably be using some information theoretic formulas 
for your, uh, ob your objective functions. Good evening, Professor. I'm from the industry in the wireless communication industry. I'm not a student here. So I don't know about Shannon theory of information theory. But I want to ask about the application in the industry in the world. How, uh, what, what change it will, it does to the industry? Like what is the benefit of it? And how is in the trend for the future in the wireless communication? Can you please enlighten us? Thank you. Thank, uh, yeah. Um, well, I mean, as, as, I, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, all these um, second generation, third generation uh, systems that we, we have now in, uh, in the current cellular technology, all those have been designed uh, very heavily influenced by information theory and coding theory. So even though these are technologies that second generation really implements concepts that date back to the 50s and 60s. Uh, third generation incorporates some of the latest advances in uh, coding, like turbo codes or low density parity check codes and so on. They have been heavily influenced by information theoretic uh, thinking. Uh, especially in what, uh, as far as point to point communications. Uh, as far as network uh, information theory, the, uh, the impact still has been minimal, except in cases like uh, multi-user receivers and so on that are already being implemented, in, say, for example, in third generation. But we still have all these challenges uh, to worry about and uh, so that theory can, down the road, uh, have an impact in the practical world. So uh, on, uh, on Thursday, I will be giving another uh, lecture. Uh, I think it's going to be here, no? It's in a big one. Big one. It's a smaller one. OK. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that means that I will, I will tune the lecture to a smaller audience, more specialized. So in that lecture, I'm going to uh, focus on the interplay between information theory and estimation theory. So this is what I mentioned before about uh, the results that uh, we obtained with uh, Dong Ningguo and also the, the, the applications that have come out after. And uh, for those of you who want to see how training matrices are being applied to wireless communication, come to IMS. Three and four, how three and four things go to spark. Thank you, Professor Chen. So, uh, uh, please put our hands together and give.